Well, I'd like to clap you all because I just am having such a good time here and learning so many interesting things from all of you. So I'd really like to thank the conference organisers for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit of information here about the type of work that we've been doing at World Animal Protection for a good number of years um, in association with the, vet com the global vet community um, surrounding <clears throat> an initiative to try and um, explore the culture of animal welfare within veterinary education. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions before I start. So, first of all, I'd like to see how many vets are there in the audience? Okay, good number. And how many people in the audience work with vets? Excellent. And how many people in the audience think that the attitudes and behaviours of vets um, are particularly impactful for animal welfare? Does anyone not? Okay, I like who I'm with, it's good, good stuff. Okay, so you agree um, very much with the um, approach that World Animal Protection has in terms of the extent to which we believe the veterinary professional, veterinary professionals, um, so paraveterinarians and veterinary nurses, can have in terms of making a positive impact and change for animal welfare. So primarily the work that we do focuses around issues of humane dog population management, uh, disaster relief and management, um, and also farm animal welfare, and also the welfare relating to wild animals. Um, but for a good number of years, we've been doing some work uh, with the veterinary community in terms of uh, veterinary education. So we've been working, and you may well have um, looked in your goodie bags. Have you seen these USB sticks? So um, we've been working for a good number of years to try and support and facilitate veterinary education in the Latin America region, Africa, and also Asia, Asia Pacific and China to integrate animal welfare into the veterinary curriculum. So it can be counterintuitive for some people to say, well, is it not already there? And I think the rationale behind that, the work started a good number of years ago, um, and it's to do with the fact that animal welfare science um, and what we do with that information is it's a relatively new science and there is a generation historically um, of vets that maybe didn't have the opportunity to learn about animal welfare in that way so not learning about animal welfare beyond health so I'm going to try and use buttons the concepts and animal welfare syllabus is um, a collaborative creation between the University of Bristol and we've got David Main here somewhere so yes back in 2003 uh, this resource was created to try and support the veterinary educators to integrate animal welfare into the veterinary curriculum. The barriers at the time were potentially that lecturers themselves hadn't been trained in animal welfare, but also that the curriculum is exceptionally crowded, and um, this uh, creation of trying to create resources to use for teaching can be quite difficult in that context. And I myself, when I was working as a lecturer, um, came across this resource and went, yes! So um, I'm really happy it exists. It exists in a variety of different languages. It has existed since 2003. It's been revised um, in 2007 and also again in 2012. Um, and it's, uh, from its inception to, to the current day, there's been a lot of support that we've gained with the veterinary community in terms of veterinary associations, saying that they feel that the resource is, is a very good resource. They've endorsed it and encouraged... Um, I think that there's been a kind of movement amongst the veterinary association community to, you know, give their logo as a, as a you know, uh, an assertion that the resource is good. The way that we work at World Animal Protection for years has been not only just to, to create, obviously, these teaching tools that help integrate animal welfare into veterinary education, but we're working with lecturers in various countries to help train them directly in animal welfare and then so that they can affect change by teaching the next generation of vets about animal welfare so that they can go on and practice animal welfare in the way that in ways in which they work. So in particular, in, for example, the Asia Pacific region, we have supported animal welfare champions or what we would term as key drivers. So they're lecturers who show a particular tenacious hunger to actually advocate for and lead in animal welfare in their various respective countries. Um, and it's really nice to have had the opportunity to work with these people to help them engage more widely with the vets in their, their peers in their own countries and drive forward positive change for animals, not only in terms of what animal welfare is included in the veterinary curriculum, but supporting local NGOs 
and also governments and initiatives to improve animal welfare, for example, if there is a rabies outbreak. But moving on from curriculum to culture, I think that where curriculum fits within the bigger picture of what culture is about, um, obviously, this is a blurry diagram, sorry about that, <laughs> I didn't see, um, but yes, so there, there's all sorts of factors that feed into what type of culture there is within, in any given level within society. So we obviously can have Western culture, we can have uh, professional culture, um, we can have um, an, a, an institutional culture. And I think it's, it's, it's thinking about where does curriculum fit into this picture and what else can be done to optimise um, the capacity we have to improve animal welfare. And I think... In relation to that, obviously, when we think about culture being to do with the way, the way we do things around here, wherever that place is, animal welfare and the impact that human behaviour has on animal welfare is obviously um, fundamental. So I just want to explore next just what impact there is in terms of where we are at with welfare as well. So in terms of how much a culture can influence welfare, so we obviously recognise that welfare and how we define it can vary in different cultures. Um, both internationally and within, for example, even at the level of different vet schools, I think. But we've moved from considering animal welfare as something to do with purely health, to, do it, to be doing with, um, sorry, the five freedoms, so the absence of negative states. But we're also, we're moved now onto the idea that we're promoting good welfare. And that's even reflected in these incentivization schemes where industry are trying to uh, essentially compete with each other. So we're trying to promote good welfare, not just prevent bad things happening. So what is the vet's role in all of this? So what behaviours can vets do that actually um, improve animal welfare? So from moving welfare from being about health through to actually advocating for good animal welfare, vets have a variety of different options. So they can work in policy and advocacy, they can work obviously with governments, but within corporates and within NGOs. They can also work in veterinary education, shaping the next generation of vets. And they also can work in practice, so they're working directly with animals. And the question then is, how well are we equipping vets to be able to do this? And are, is there any reason that we need to be, I need to be standing here talking about improving the culture um, for, of veterinary education to promote humane behaviour and good animal welfare in that context? So. A little bit of research. Um, here we have some findings. They started really emerging in the beginning, well, in around the year 2000. So there were whisperings of a potential hardening effect in veterinary education. So different research papers were finding that there was a decline in moral reasoning in certain veterinary student populations. They were becoming less sentimental as they progressed through their veterinary education. Declines in belief in animal sentience. Um, decline in the regard for the importance of the human-animal bond. Um, and that there were subtle differences as well, well, significant but subtle um, differences between vet students and the faculty. So you would maybe have vet students having a more strong belief in the capacity for animals to feel pain than faculty, but that depended on which study you looked at because it could be the other way in different places. Um, also, that, uh, you know, it was very much to do with an increased focus on the learning aspects and the scientific aspects of looking at animals in that, in that context. So... I would like to emphasise that a lot of these studies were cross-sectional rather than longitudinal, despite the fact they were looking at the effect of vet education over time. Um, a study I did as part of my PhD was looking at um, longitudinal measures to do with belief in animal sentience, and I actually believe that the, day, the way I asked that question, which was through quantitative methods, we didn't find a significant decrease in um, belief in animal sentience. In fact, I think we found an increase in belief in animal sentience in terms of pigs. Um, and I wonder whether the question we're asking is not really a reflection of what people are actually thinking or a reflection of how socially acceptable it is to say that animals are sentient. There's all sorts of different things that could be, be being tapped into by that form of questioning. Um, the veterinary curriculum, for example, in the UK has, has, has definitely just improved in terms of the amount of animal welfare incorporated. But um, when I was talking with a lot of vet students as part of my PhD with um, one, using one-to-one -one, uh, interviews, I, I felt like I found a lot more in-depth, subtle information about what the culture of animal welfare was in, in the context of the vet school. 
Um, I think there is some feeling that, that vets, as part of their training, are required to, you know, get familiar and cope with the, the various difficulties that they face, and there are a hell of a lot in terms of who their duties are to, in terms of the client, the animal, um, their profession, for example. But I would like to emphasise here that there's some common problems if if there is a hardening effect associated with veterinary education, which would be counterintuitive to trying to improve animal welfare in that context. So in human medicine, there's a lot more research. Um, it's a lot more longitudinal than the type of data that's been collected, and there are what we call meta-analyses, so where people have analysed the results of different studies and looked at the overall effect. And there does seem to be uh, a problem. And it's quite counterintuitive. They've identified objectification processes, or what they call dehumanisation processes, and it's those, those mechanisms, psychological mechanisms, are also identified in the context of slavery, sexism, um, ageism, you name it. But in the context of medical education, the incentive is to actually improve the welfare of the human patient. And obviously that mirrors that, the context in vet education. And so what we have here is a situation where there's something counterintuitive going on. And I would say that the, the, the evidence from the human medicine literature is actually better quality than from the vet context. So, here we have a bit more of a holistic view about what's going on in terms of what happens when we're educating about animal welfare in the formal curriculum. So, attitudes we hope are being shaped by what we're learning about. So, knowledge of animal welfare sits very much in the cognitive domain of how attitudes are formed. Um, attitudes don't necessarily lead to certain behaviours, but we'd like to think that we're doing, moving things in the right direction. Um, overall, though, effect um, and empathy and the emotions we experience are highly influential. And that is something that I think the, the animal welfare in the veterinary context of the curriculum and the formal teaching can't necessarily tap into because of some potential barriers there. And I think there's a lot of different factors that affect attitudes towards animals, but in the vet context, um, at the education level, where in human medicine, education has been identified as a key point at which objectification and dehumanisation will start. Um, we've got role models and we've got social norms that are very well established and entrenched in those, in those contexts. And so essentially, in the human medicine literature, there's a lot of talk about a silent curriculum, a hidden curriculum, and it's certainly something you read more about in the context of veterinary education now. But um, just to, to give you an idea, I found it was on... Google or Amazon, I found this book the other day, which was written by a vet student who was trying to say, oh my God, there was all these things happening during my education, um, and it was terrible. Um, and then you read the reviews about the book, and there's people who went to university with this person going, this person was a nutter, they were crazy, and so I'm like, okay. Um, but I haven't read the book, so I don't know what it says. But it's an indication that there's this kind of contrast going on. And a silent curriculum is much about the behaviors and um, Within, within the context of the education institution that are kind of unlabeled, um, but unconscious, I think, as well, not stated as specific learning outcomes, whereas a formal curriculum will have that component. And so we have to ask what's happening. Are we having explicit learning outcomes that say animal welfare is important and that we need to understand this in order to do this? And then we're having learning outcomes as part of a silent curriculum that maybe, as an example, there may be a, a practical where they're learning about pig castration and on site um, on the vet, at the vet school and no pain relief is being provided. And I, I have been in contexts like that and I have seen that none of the vet students have actually raised the issue. So there's, there's something going on that's counterintuitive here. And so what we really wanted to do at World Animal Protection was to try and work with the veterinary community to instigate an initiative that would help understand and paint a picture of all the really, really good things, of which there are loads of really, really good things happening in vet schools, all the positive ways in which welfare is being shaped and the behaviours of vets, future vets, um, and the role models in the vet school can actually promote good welfare. <clears throat> so it was about really working with the team of vets internally at World Animal Protection and then the specific institutions that we currently and have for a num good number of years worked with to ask about what we need to do. So it was like, well, why don't we identify some key standard areas that all vet schools could aim towards to demonstrate how well they're doing in terms of upholding and leading um, in these positive animal welfare practices and behaviours? 
And so it's about developing a consensus on the key standards that demonstrate good animal welfare practices, about trying to embed these standards across all vet schools and influencing the future vets to actually be advocates because they're practicing behaviors in, during their education that are positive for animal welfare. And so we were hoping that we would kind of arrive at this ability to identify centers of excellence in animal welfare within the veterinary sphere. So we started out obviously developing an idea internally and with our stakeholders about what these standards need to, needed to look like. So here is a list of what we came up with in summary. Um, I've underlined and highlighted the ones that had, um, I think, probably the biggest potential in terms of the actual behaviours that we can identify that need to happen in the vet school context. And basically, we asked the vet community to... Um, via an online survey, we sent information about these standards out and we asked the vet community to let us know what they thought. So, um, here we have that we got 2,600 responses globally from people, vets um, and veterinary professionals in a variety of areas uh, from um, between, it was in 2014, so we launched the survey on World Vet Day. And basically, I, I, what I really love about this is that there were so many vet students engaged in this, you know, and, and they're the ones who are driving the demand for what they maybe want to um, have access to during their studies. So we established through this survey that, yes, um, people, the, the respondents saw perceived benefits to increasing, improving animal welfare education within the vet context. Um, they felt that the intrinsic value to the animal was the priority in that process. The criteria for welfare standards of excellence they very much agreed with. I'll just skirt over very quickly which ones they had the most strong level of agreement with. Um, in terms of how we should assess these standards, there was um, some uncertainty, so whether it should be peer assessment or, or um, external people who would come in and assess the degree to which vet schools were upholding these standards. But overall, the important thing is that the community were mobilised to agree, yes, there should be some kind of award scheme that incentivizes and recognizes excellence in animal welfare being demonstrated at the vet education level. And so, um, and probably one of the key things was continuous professional development. So making sure that the vet educators in the vet school are actually themselves undergoing animal welfare education, either because they haven't beforehand or because when they last did, you know, there's been advances in terms of teaching practices and all sorts of things that they could take on board and improve. Um, student involvement is about supporting the students to actually engage in animal welfare clubs um, and to want to do research projects in animal welfare. Um, engage in outreach activities in the local community, all those sorts of things. You'd be encouraged and supported to do that rather than possibly feeling like it's, it's not the nuts and bolts of what veterinary medicine is about, which is potentially health. Um, and the humane use of animals, obviously there's been some great talks that have addressed the issue of alternatives and implementation of the three R's. So that's another, and then, so I want to emphasize again that there's vet schools that are already doing these things that we have identified. So, for example, the Jean Marchic Centre, the Royal Vet College I've been had to has a great clinical skills training suite using alternatives. Um, there's all sorts of different things, and I think we just need to get into the mindset of role modeling these and sharing the information on some kind of global platform where all vet schools can, can see what's going on and, and, and feel that they want to be a part of it. And so, just to wrap up, um, if you would like to have a further look at what our guidelines include, there's a, a lot of information and writing in a document that we have hosted online on uh, a website called the Global Animal Network. Um, and so the, the address is there, but I would be happy to, to share more information about that with anyone who wants to, to know more. I think that the key thing, the take home message is, is that we need to go beyond curriculum and think about culture in terms of where animal welfare sits in the veterinary education. And we do need to work collaboratively with the vet community. One of the best questions someone asked me during this whole process of developing um, these standards was, well, why is an NGO leading on this? It's like, we don't want to. <laughs> we don't want to lead on it. We want to mobilize everyone and get everyone to work as a community. And for now, at this point in time, the vet community to take it on and drive it forwards. And so we're having some very positive discussions with the World Veterinary Association, who have been very supportive of this initiative from the very beginning. Um, and so I think... I'll leave it at that because I talk too much. <laughs> um, and I'd like to say thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you.